Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, students, and friends, good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor to welcome you all to this fourth Lucis keynote, one of the premier events of the Leiden University Center for the Study of Islam and Society. A, particularly, a particular warm welcome to our keynote speaker of today, Professor Bishara Dumani. I should, also, <laughs> I should also like to welcome our respondents, Gerry Tahar and Solim Nabansian, for today's public discussion, uh, for, uh, um, for their uh, contribution, and our moderator for today's public uh, discussion, Kutsel Jesut Gjaats. My name is Natal Dessing, and I'm director of LUCIS. LUCIS, the Leiden University Center for the Study of Islam and Society, is an interdisciplinary hub of Leiden University, bringing together scholars in all faculties researching and conducting uh, and, and teaching within the field of the Middle East and Islamic studies. We aim to contribute to the debate about Islam and society in the broadest sense, within and outside academia. We organize scholarly events, such as the annual Lucis keynotes, as well as expert meetings and cultural and public events like the Middle East uh, Culture Market in the Museum of Antiquities. Today's Lucis keynote is on the very special topic of academic freedom. I, like, I should like to say a few words to highlight the relevance of this topic for our university today. The motto of Leiden University is Presidium Libertatis, or Bastion of Freedom. It portrays the university as a place of freedom. Like many mottos, it is not entirely clear what it means or what it is to be a place of freedom. The university seems to apply it in three contexts. First, Presidium Libertatis guarantees academic freedom in the strict sense, freedom from censorship in research and teaching to all those working and studying at Leiden University. Second, it seems to guarantee freedom of speech in the broadest sense, the freedom of researchers and students to contribute to societal debates, perhaps even outside one's own field of expertise. Third, in the mythology uh, around the motto, the university is also proud of its history of protest against injustices and, its, and of its role welcoming refugees and people under threat. For example, Professor Rudolf Kleveringa's public protest against the dismissal of two Jewish colleagues during World War II is commemorated in the Kleveringa lecture every November on the anniversary of the protest. The auditorium in which we meet this afternoon is named after Benjamin Telders, one of the Jewish professors who Kleveringa defended and who was killed in Nazi concentration camps. The motto Presidium Libertatis is, however, sometimes applied selectively and partially. On the one hand, how could this be otherwise? There are no absolute freedoms, and even freedom of speech is to be exercised under the law and within the bounds of responsibility. On the other hand, some groups within the university have formed the impression over the years that Presidium Libertatis does not hold fully for them or for the intellectual and social causes that they hold dear. Lucis is, of course, active in the field of Middle East and, and Islamic studies. This afternoon, therefore, we are hoping to explore what Presidium Libertatis means and what it might mean specifically for the field of Middle East studies. This is a field in which scholarly inquiry inevitably comes up against questions of social and political rights. 
Is there a boundary between scholarly inquiry in Middle East studies on the one hand and active advocacy for one or another side in geopolitical conflicts on the other hand? And if so, how is this boundary drawn, constituted, shifted and policed? Do different standards of academic freedom hold on one side of the boundary from the other? And in what ways do professional norms and standards channel and constrain academic freedom, promoting particular ways of knowing and disqualifying others? The main questions that I hope we will address today with the help of our distinguished lecturer and our other distinguished speakers include, how can the category of academic freedom be negotiated in the contested field of Middle East studies? Is it possible, and if so, how, to draw a sharp distinction between scholarly inquiry on the one hand and moral or political engagement on the other, between describing the world, evaluating the world, and trying to reshape the world? What legitimate grounds may there be for limiting freedom of speech in Middle East studies? Are any standpoints out of bounds? And if so, for what kind of reasons? What do the answers to these questions mean for the interpretation and the implementation of our university's motto, Presidium Libertatis, in the field of Middle East studies? I look forward very much to the uh, light that will be shed on these and further questions this afternoon. Before handing the floor over, I should like to thank all colleagues at Uver and university officers who have helped to make this Lucy's keynote uh, possible. I should also like to thank Shaima al Morabet and Tolga Gunnery of the Lucy's office for their great practical support. I see here Shaima uh, sitting on the second row. The program of the afternoon is as follows. First, Professor Domani will del deliver his Lucy's keynote entitled, What do we mean when we say academic freedom? It will be followed by a 15-minute break in which, unfortunately, because of house, rule, house rules, we will be unable to offer tea and coffee. So sorry, but I think we still need the break shortly. Uh, after the break, we continue with two comments uh, of 10 minutes each, uh, of 10 minutes each by Gerita Haar and by Tzolien Nalbansian. Gerita Haar is a scholar of religion specializing in the religious traditions of Africa and the African diaspora. Tzolien Nalbansian is a historian of the modern Middle East at the Leiden University Institute for Area Studies. The public discussion that will follow will be moderated by Kutso Jesu Geit. He's professor of public administration at the Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs. He's also a member of the Lucis Steering Committee. The program will be concluded with a reception at approximately 5.30, to which you are all warmly invited. Now I should like to introduce to you our Lucis keynote speaker. Bashar Dumani is Professor of History and the inaugural holder of the Mahmoud Darwish Professorship of Palestinian Studies at Brown University. His research focuses on peoples, places and time periods marginalized by mainstream scholarship on the early uh, modern and modern Middle East. He also writes on academic freedom and the Palestinian condition. His books include Rediscovering Palestine, Merchants and Peasants in Jabal Nablus, and Family Life in the Ottoman Mediterranean, a Social History. He's the editor of Academic Freedom after September 11, and that's uh, maybe the first reason why I invited you. He's currently working on a history of the Palestinians through the social life of stone. Dumani was a fellow at, at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, Harvard University, and the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. 
He's the founding, founding director of the Palestinian Museum, of the New Directions in Palestinian Studies Network, and of the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University. Professor Dumani stands for engaged scholarship, to, for scholarship with a purpose, and also emphasizes the importance of being in the field. He's currently serving as president of Birzeit University in Palestine. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dumani uh, for this, uh, and uh, please take the floor. Thank you, Natal, for a very generous introduction and for organizing this event, I know it was not easy, especially in light of the events that happened earlier in the university, which I'll also talk about briefly. <clears throat> I'd like to also thank Leiden University for hosting me, um, and of course the commentators uh, whose names have already been mentioned, so I will not repeat them again, uh, <clears throat> and the moderator, um, as well as all of you for attending this talk. What do we mean when we say academic freedom. <clears throat> so Presidium Libertatis, as we just heard, is widely understood to mean freedom of individual scholars <clears throat> from censorship on research, teaching, and free speech. But can there be academic freedom without collective access to education, without institutional autonomy of universities? Can it exist under conditions of social inequality, and especially for the Palestinians under conditions of settler colonialism. What governs which claims, and by whom, for freedom are heard, and which ones shunned? How to align the liberal notion of critical thinking with the ethical responsibility of engaged scholarship for the social good? What if our conceptual vocabulary, <clears throat> research questions, theories, and methodologies are themselves products of a history of colonialism and imperial domination? Would presidium libertatis then also mean freedom from epistemologies, colonial epistemologies, and a serious engagement with indigenous ways of knowing? And finally, how to institutionally shift universities from a market orientation that reproduces existing power relations to an agent that facilitates, an agent of change that facilitates a more just, equal, inclusive, and sustainable world. <clears throat> I will address four dimensions of academic freedom today. One is academic freedom and the right to education. Two, academic freedom as an ethical practice. Three, academic freedom as decolonizing epistemologies of knowledge production. And four, academic freedom as engaged scholarship with a focus on institutionalizing academic freedom in the university. <clears throat> so first, academic freedom and the right to education. Now my first sort of serious engagement with academic freedom took place in 1981 when I joined the faculty at Birzeit University as a lecturer. Birzeit University in uh, Palestine is in the Ramallah area just north of the Ramallah, the city of Ramallah. Uh, and it's Palestine's oldest and most important uh, university. It started off as a girls' school in 1924 and was announced as a university in 1972. Um, to teach in the Department of Cultural Studies, your very basic kind of liberal education requirements. We taught four required courses. The first was ancient history, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and so on all the way to medieval philosophers, to um, the Enlightenment thought, uh, Rousseau, Locke, Hobbes, etc., to Marx and Mao and 20th century decolonial movements in four sort of steps. 
And that was a very typical kind of arrangement in um, liberal arts colleges, and especially in Beirut University, which was a place which trained people to go to the American University of Beirut, which started off as the Protestant college and then became the American University of Beirut. And the religious, of course, dimension here is very important. Every one of the major universities started off in many ways as a religious institution. <clears throat> but when I arrived at Birzeit, I was immediately and forcefully embroiled in a more structural, collective understanding of academic freedom, which is the right to education. As a result of forced closures of the university by the Israeli military, uh, raids, and other punitive measures, uh, as a method of punishment against the freedom of expression by students and faculty calling for a homeland free from a foreign occupation. So the most <clears throat> common understanding of academic freedom, I should say, especially as championed by the United Nations, is the right to education in the face of restrictions to access to education imposed as a result of filters such as class, caste, gender, race, and so on. The emphasis here is not on individual rights, but on collective rights. Quote, everyone has a right to education, unquote, Article 26 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights states, and it follows, technical and professional education shall be made generally available, and higher education shall be equally accessible to all on the basis of merit. <clears throat> now, of course, we understand that the United Nations and all its declarations is an expression of a liberal discourse on human rights and international law, especially as they developed after the demise of empires and the rise of nation states. Uh, <clears throat> so that itself, uh, of course, is a particular way of seeing the world. Uh, but at Beers 8 University, uh, this right to education um, discourse was taken to heart in two different ways. First, uh, Beers 8 University is committed to ensuring that all students enrolled will finish their education regardless of their ability to pay for that education. Uh, that is why it collects only 75 to 80 percent of its tuition <laughs> every year. Uh, it's the only university in Palestine that will not dismiss students who cannot pay and that gives millions in financial aid free tuition to all students who score an average of 85 or more each semester, as well as free tuition to children of employees, etc. But it also has a second um, value uh, regarding the right to education, which is resisting Israeli military violations uh, <clears throat> of access to education and, of course, raising international awareness uh, about this, which is partly why I'm here. Uh, <clears throat> now, let me talk about the second. Um, the military, the Israeli military has imposed a kind of a, a siege, a, let's say a procedural and mental siege, like a physical barrier almost, that tr tries to isolate the university. So on the one hand, we suffer from a great deal of structural violence. Uh, the university, for example, during the first Intifada or uprising uh, was closed for four entire years straight. It was forced shut. Uh, <clears throat> raids, um, you cannot get the equipment you need for your labs, banned books, uh, etc. arrest of students and faculty, uh, etc. There is a form of structural violence which we live under. But there's also a, let's say, um, a calculated policy to isolate the university from the larger currents of intellectual exchange and thought which is absolutely vital to every university. This isolation in 1981 for me was represented in Military Order 854, which made work permits conditional on signing a statement that the Palestine Liberation Organization is a terrorist organization. Otherwise, you could not get a work permit. <clears throat> and uh, this, of course, was an attempt to delegitimize uh, Palestinian struggle for self-determination. This was for foreign nationals who wanted to teach at Birzeit University. Uh, more recently, 
Um, you probably heard about the new issuing of new procedures for entry of foreign nationals announced by Israel. Um, <clears throat> by the Coordinator of Government Activities in the Territories, COGAT, which is a part of the Israeli uh, uh, Department of Ministry of Defense. These, quote, procedures for entry and residency of foreigners in Judea and Samaria region, rem there's no Palestine here, uh, <clears throat> uh, were, um, let's just say, putting on paper policies and practices that they've been following for many, many years. But as a result of lawsuits and resistance and raising awareness about them, they were forced in the end to put them in on words on paper. And this uh, revealed for much of the world what has been going on for many years. For example, uh, the announced procedures invest the Israeli military the right to select which international faculty, academic researchers, and students may be present at Palestinian universities, as well as impose their own arbitrary criteria on which fields of study are permissible and what qualifications are acceptable. For example, entry would be approved only if it was proven to the satisfaction of a military officer that the invited professor has, quote, a significant contribution, can make a significant contribution to academic education, to the region's economy, or the promotion of cooperation and regional peace. And this is all code words, of course, for legitimizing and normalizing the occupation. Another example, it requires each applicant to submit to interrogation to, at an Israeli diplomatic mission in the country of origin, while imposing stiff monetary bonds on those selected for entry. Further, the directive sets a very low ceiling on the number of foreign teachers and researchers. There are 35 registered universities, but they are, according to these procedures, and allowing only 100 faculty, foreign faculty, to be present, and only 150 students for all, international students for all of them. And it limits the duration of employment to five non-consecutive years, thereby denying sustainable hiring and promotion of faculty. Plainly put, the procedures I just mentioned, and this is only the tip of the iceberg, put Palestinian universities under siege and divest them of basic control over their academic decisions. In other words, these practices and procedures constitute a severe violation of institutional autonomy, and institutional autonomy is absolutely fundamental to academic freedom. <clears throat> For administrators, let me say what this actually really means in practice. They interfere in the discretion of Palestinian administrators of higher education determining their own needs and in making decisions about their academic priorities, about their academic standards, about their management of academic hiring, uh, about even the identity of the lecturers and their required academic training, and on the number of lectures and subjects taught. Now, there's two other ways of um, interfering in the social autonomy of Palestinian universities. One is uh, blocking external funding. Now, I should say, before I forget, that as a result of a lot of pressure and lobbying, uh, just last month, they announced some changes to these procedures, and they postponed their implementation until October 5th. Uh, some of that pressure came from the United States because many of those affected were American citizens who were treated, uh, let's say, in a discriminatory manner. Um, and right now, some of the most offensive sort of clauses were pulled out, but the devil is in the details of the implementation, and so we'll see what happens. Uh, blocking external funding has been a very important part of Israeli policy towards uh, higher education. I call it the, uh, the power of boilerplate language. So uh, uh, through successful lobbying uh, in the European Union Parliament and various governments, uh, the Israeli uh, government was able to uh, convince or persuade various governments in Europe and of course the EU members to attach a clause to any contract 
for funding of research projects uh, that the university, like Buzet, may win as a part of a competition and so on. Uh, that lists specific Palestinian organizations as terrorist organizations. And so if the university is to accept the grant that they won in the competition on whatever the topic may be, and I've seen grants such as on gender equality, on uh, journalism, on um, a variety of topics, uh, when Buzet University refuses to sign these contracts, therefore they lose them. Uh, very much reminiscent of Military Order 854. And last is a severe and very worrying attack over the past two years on civil society institutions in Palestine, including human rights organizations, raiding of their offices, closing them, etc. Uh, as president of Birzeit University, I see the attacks on organizations such as Al-Haq and, and so on as just a prelude for a larger attack on civil society organizations of which the backbone are the universities. And I worry that uh, a year or two or three from now they will find reasons to shut down these universities altogether. What about academic freedom as an ethical practice? What do I mean? Well, um, as you all know, uh, the notion of academic freedom in the United States, and I wrote about a book about this a book, and I, I don't want to repeat everything here, but um, let's just say that, uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, let's just say that um, the notion of academic freedom is developed in the late 19th century and in the United States as put into paper as part of the foundation of the American Association of University Professors during World War I, um, conceived of academic freedom <coughs> as a guild-like arrangement. What do I mean by that? That in exchange for self-regulation, that is to say peer review, uh, setting certain standards, at what is acceptable, what is not acceptable scholarship by the scholars themselves. These scholars, by censoring themselves, so to speak, by regulating themselves, uh, then they have gained the right to freedom of research, writing, and uh, teaching. Uh, so um, <clears throat> this was considered to be a very important solution to the problem of attempts at censorship of what academics might or might not say in various uh, universities. You left it up to them to regulate themselves and in return they received a degree protection. And the most important part of that protection was the tenure system. That is to say after six years, just like in a guild, you apprentice for six years and then you become a master or in this case a tenured professor. And once you do, then it's almost imp impossible to fire you. You have protection of security of, of job that would allow you to, and many, many, of course, professors uh, in the United States uh, see that moment of receiving tenure as the moment in which they can unleash their tongue, <laughs> so to speak. Um, though my own personal opinion is if people don't unleash it from the very beginning, they never will because there will always be then the promotion to associate and then the promotion to full and then the promotion to dean and president. And if you keep your tongue leashed until you reach all your promotions, you'll probably retire before you unleash. Uh, so, <laughs> but that's my personal opinion. Um, <clears throat> now, this um, situation uh, has served American uh, universities well. It's become part of the DNA of what it means to be professor in the United States, this idea of academic freedom. But there have always been many attacks on this individual right uh, to freedom of uh, research, teaching, and, and writing uh, in various periods. The McCarthy era is very famous for that in the 1950s, the Cold War and uh, Red Scare uh, many university professors, artists, and others were forced out of their jobs, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was followed in many ways by a 
much greater expansion of academic freedom in the United States. As universities themselves changed, uh, they became less and less elite universities for producing a certain class of people and more and more a place where uh, people who've never had a chance at a university education, especially working class people, uh, women, uh, African Americans, and others were able to enroll in large numbers after World War II. Uh, and we all know about the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, sort of almost student-led revolution in thinking about what a university is, what it should cover, what kinds of courses should be offered, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I would say a little bit later that this became very important to the development of Middle East and Islamic studies as the ways that they've been organized in the past underwent a kind of a revolution during the 60s and the 70s. But after, uh, beginning in the 90s, but especially after September 11th, 2001, uh, many worrying trends started resurfacing in American academia that threatened academic freedom, which in really led me to uh, become a bit of an activist on this issue and also write this book and so on. Uh, the erosion of academic freedom in the U.S. after September 11th was, as I argued in the book, a confluence of two trends. First, the rising tide of intolerance, especially anti-Muslim intolerance, of populism and anti-intellectualism. Um, that found its ways to various uh, state laws, federal government restrictions, and policies of some university administrations. For example, a book about Islamic religion was supposed to be taught as an entry book for freshman class, and, and the administration f fell under a great deal of pressure from politicians who says you should not teach about this book even though it was written by a Jewish professor and was a very, very nilla kind of book, but um, that was a big struggle. That was just one small example of what was happening. But this is the hammer. The anvil, and the universities were stuck in between, was the increasing uh, corporatization of universities as institutions. Corporate culture, neoliberal economic policies, uh, were introduced into universities, which had to depend more and more uh, on external sources of funding as governments cut back their um, budgets. Uh, state universities, such as the University of California, Berkeley, where I taught for 15 years, uh, is supposed to be a state university, but it receives less than 10% of its budget from the state. It has to make up all the rest through fundraising, mostly from corporations and rich donors uh, uh, and, and, and others. And there is a kind of a price to pay for that. Um, there's far less um, support of uh, basic research, uh, far less interest in the humanities, uh, much higher tuitions, much greater uh, hiring of contingent labor, that is to say non-tenured uh, temporary professors. Uh, in other words, putting the financial cart before the academic horse became a way to run a university. And that uh, is the anvil. And universities were stuck in between the two, a kind of repression from above and from outside groups that tried to police what people could say, teach, or write, but also a kind of a corporate structure uh, from uh, the bottom that limited uh, certain, structurally limited certain ways of knowing. That was what the book uh, was about. But it was driven for me uh, by the realization that uh, the question of merit and objectivity and this truth seeking often hid entrenched patterns of discrimination. And I want to give you, and I think probably this is the first time I'll talk about this uh, uh, so publicly, um, uh, an example. Uh, or a couple of examples of the blind spots uh, that affect who is deserving of academic freedom when it comes to hiring, to promotion, to recognition uh, within the university. Uh, we all know uh, that uh, women, for example, um, constitute a very important part of the student body and of uh, 
PhD graduates, yet they have very little role often in administrations or uh, far underrepresented departments. The same thing can be said of other uh, underrepresented groups. In the case of being born Palestinian or uh, being an academic while Palestinian, uh, I can tell you that it was not easy for a lot of people. Um, <coughs> Many professors uh, specific in Middle East studies specifically told their students who are doing their PhDs and interested in doing it on Palestine or the Palestinians, don't do it. Make that your second book. If you ever want to get hired anywhere, you should write about something else, Egypt or Lebanon or something, and then get hired and then do your second book on this topic. Uh, <coughs> and here, uh, I just want to give a very simple example about a name. Wh how does, what does your name have to do with this? My name is Bishara Dumani. I, when I was hoping to go back to Birzeit University when I was finishing my PhD, but it was the first intifada broke out. The university was shut down. I applied for jobs in the United States. Uh, one place I applied was the University of Vermont, and I got a letter back, a very short letter, that said, uh, our policy is not to hire any non-US citizens. Now, one, of course, I was a US citizen, <laughs> and I did not provide any documentation, of course, about that citizenship. Nobody would do that in a regular application. They decided I was not just because of my name. Uh, so they would not even consider me and of course, that was an illegal thing to do as well. There's no, no law in the United States that you cannot hire a US, non-US citizen. But they felt confident enough, in fact, they were blind enough to write such a letter without thinking that what that means. Now, I did apply to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and they did uh, call me for an interview as a shortlist candidate. And the question, one of the questions I received during my interview was, would you be fair to Jewish students? And my quick answer was, this is a racist question. If my name was John Smith, you would have never asked me this question. You only ask it because of my name. I found out later, years later, uh, the head of the, of course, um, I did get the job <laughs> at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, <clears throat> And that was because the people on the committee, when I confronted them with that answer, did not automatically get defensive and shut me out, but rather thought about what I said and uh, realized what they were doing. And th that's an important thing. We, I think we should never uh, underestimate the importance of standing up for your rights, even if it affects a single person. That person can change the world. Um, <clears throat> but the head of the search committee confided in me years later, while I was still at the university, that um, they had trouble forming their committee because when they invited the head of the Middle East Studies Center at the time, he said, uh, on condition, I'll join the committee, but on condition, you don't hire an Arab. That would be far too controversial for the University of Pennsylvania. Now, he felt free to say that because that was the common thought at the time. You don't bring such a person to this university because there'll be controversy and problems and you don't know what they will say and so on and so forth. Uh, luckily, they refused that condition, so that's why I, in the end I got hired. Uh, <clears throat> now, it is true that on my office door, it happened a few times, I would find notes like death to Arabs, we know where you live, and so on and so forth, uh, written by people who are of course, I don't know who they are. I assume somebody at the university. Um, and I eventually left the University of Pennsylvania for a more hospitable, I thought, atmosphere at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, but after many years there, um, despite the fact that f faculty voted more than once to have me elected as the head of Middle East Studies there, I was always denied. And one time, a senior administrator came to me and said, I'm very friendly, I'm a leftist, I completely understand, I support the Palestinians, but you must understand that I'm in a very difficult situation. There is a policy of never allowing a Palestinian to be head of Middle East Studies at UC Berkeley. 
uh, and she said that with a she wants my sympathy at her uh, difficult situation that she's in, not realizing that she's part of reinforcing a kind of a racist policy. So, Dean Azbedi, she had a name. And I think it was her name that made her ineligible for hosting this event that the students and others wanted to host at the university. Um, if she had a different name, then maybe she would have been considered a neutral. Um, um, what's the word? Facilitator or uh, interlocutor for the event. So I tell this story uh, because I think it's very important and of course I recognize that I was invited here by Latin University and I think that speaks volumes. Uh, but I do think that it's important for universities to think, just like the member of that committee thought, that they should reconsider their position and maybe act in a different way. And I think it will be very important. Um, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not a member of this community and I, I don't want to give any advice. It's not my place to do so. But um, if I was in their place, I would issue some sort of an apology. <clears throat> um, uh, thank you. Um, I think it is important to open our minds, hearts, and institutional space for students and professors who have come, I think, rightly, to see that the Palestinian fight for dignity, freedom, and justice have become a litmus test for rights for all. And that is most obvious in the clear positions taken by the Black Lives Matter movement, which in its platform made Palestinian rights central to their struggle against racism in the United States. The reason they did that is because they understood that if you don't, if you don't pass that litmus test, you can't be just progressive on everything except Palestine. You can't be politically correct on everything except Palestine. That is what is called the Palestinian exception to free speech, and it's an old battle in the United States, a battle which I've lived through many, many iterations of. And it took the form uh, early on in my career back in the 70s and 80s when I was a graduate student. Uh, the word Palestine was radioactive. It could not be said in polite company. If you said it out loud in a restaurant, the faculty club, or in a classroom, everybody would immediately become quiet. And you've said the unspeakable. Of course, now people can say it very easily, and much has changed and much has changed, uh, partly because uh, people have never given up uh, this struggle. They engaged in uh, what were called in the 70s and 80s the campus wars. Uh, constant debates, hard feelings, shouting back and forth, uh, one workshop and event against the other uh, between those who support Israel, those who support the Palestinians, that war was largely over by the 1990s. It was clear, I think, to observers that if you just argue the issue on its merits, um, it was clear that the Palestinians um, deserved the right to be free and could not be denied that right. And it was getting harder and harder to convince faculty and students to carry the torch for Israel. And I remember at the University of California, Berkeley, some, sometime in the mid-90s, suddenly all these debates ended as if somebody just blew a whistle and one next year there was no events organized against any pro-Palestinian speech by students or faculty. Instead, every time there was an activity, something would come from the top down, from the administration or some other group outside the university or the state legislature or some powerful top-down force that would say no. But there was no 
resistance on the ground level. I think because the battle was largely won. Any student who really wants to know and really wants to study, I think, um, or better still, go there and see for themselves, uh, will not have a hard time understanding the Palestinian position and that Israel, like every human rights organization practically in the world, the United Nations, its own human rights organizations, Israeli ones, etc., looks and sees, understands to be a state of appetite and structural violence against an entire people. Uh, one has to be willfully ignorant not to uh, study that literature and see for themselves and make up their own mind. And I think um, it's one of the most watched and documented issues of our times. So um, the Palestinian exception to free speech, I think, can be seen as a kind of a metaphor for a larger critique about the way that the disciplines themselves in the academy were formed. What do I mean by that? Here I want to move to the third point, which is academic freedom is decolonizing epistemologies of knowledge production. That is to say, the 90s, 2000s, and until now, disciplinary orthodoxies have come under tremendous criticism. What is history? What is sociology? What is anthropology? How have these disciplines been historically constructed? What are their basic assumptions, ways of knowing? How did these theories and their conceptual vocabulary come about? And this set of questions about the disciplines were cited by many as attacks on academic freedom themselves. Like, why are you attacking my discipline? I have the right to think the way and write the way that I do. But I would like to argue that challenging disciplinary orthodoxies, especially when pursued with rigor, theoretical and methodological rigor and, and case studies, is the very epitome of what it means to have academic freedom. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the colonial irony and paradox of academic freedom. We are very familiar with the liberal view that knowledge production is the practice of critical thinking for the purpose of progress and enlightenment through truth seeking. Unfettered by dogma, hovering above the political fray, and driven by rational inquiry, objective and neutral knowledge production seems to be the best way forward but we must remember that the very conceptual vocabulary of liberal thought, as idealistic, humane, and universal as it may seem, was actually forged by bloody and brutal encounters of European imperial conquest and the genocides of central colonialism. These encounters, hundreds of years, from one may argue uh, the quote-unquote discovery of the new world in the late 15th century, which at the time contained a third of the population of the world. From that time, the expansion, the destruction of these native indigenous communities by the tens of millions, uh, the conquest of others that were far more settled and known of course, in this country, and especially in the United States, we understand that history. These encounters in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century shaped core knowledge regimes and generated classificatory categories about the human, the notion of the human, the notion of society, the notion of economy and nature that informed political cultures and social relations. These were not things that have always existed. These were ideas that were formed and forged at that time. No major field of scholarly inquiry, scientific endeavor, or literary or artistic expression is untouched 
by this encounter, colonial encounter. Indeed, it is fair to say that the modern disciplines and the liberal arts, humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences, and their enduring concerns developed through a centuries-long productive tension between enabling this world, universities played a very important part in enabling this world, while at the same time producing critical knowledge about it. Hence the colonial irony and paradox. The irony is that liberal, humanist, rational, scientific, and universalist thought is implicated and forged in the superheated violence of genocide, ethnic cleansing, racialized capitalism, and massive ecological destruction. The colonial paradox is the very analytical vocabulary of critique, the master's tools, so to speak, about the Lord's words, are themselves a product of the colonial encounter. So how can you build a new house with the master's tools, she asks. Now, let me just give a quick example of what I mean. Uh, when colonists spread throughout what became known as the Americas, they, and of course, encountered native indigenous communities, uh, they asked themselves certain questions. Are they human? Are they children of God? Can they be saved and redeemed? Can they form political communities? Do they have rights? What are their natural rights? Um, and I can go on. These were intense debates that were taking place at the time. And it's through these debates, for example, that John Locke developed his ideas about property, about labor, and the notion of the empty land, that if the land belongs to the tiller and if the tiller is not tilling the land, that land is empty and ready for colonization by somebody else. And they saw these indigenous communities as not being tillers of the land in the sense that they understood land should be used, for example. And his thought and his framing of this question um, came directly as a result of thinking about this kind of encounter. And they, of course, were extremely influential in setting up the modern contract society as we know it. Uh, David Graeber and David Wengro in their book, The Dawn of Everything, begin with a now strongly uh, supported but still a familiar argument that takes this point a little further. They argue that the debates and topics central to the emergence of Enlightenment thought were precipitated and shaped not just by this encounter with natives and indigenous people, but also with them taking seriously indigenous critiques, intellectual critiques of Western society on the nature of freedom, on an equality, on rationality, on religion, like, of course, what it means to be human. For example, Rousseau's hugely influential 1754 essay, Discourse on the Origin and Foundations of Inequality Among Mankind, which is, of course, required teaching everywhere practically in the world as a quintessentially Western sort of essential idea, was actually, actually, not the book that began the debate on this question, but rather was submitted as part of an essay competition on this topic. This was the competition that was announced in which he wrote this essay on. Why was this competition announced? Because the interventions, especially intellectual interventions of a native indigenous um, when that people known as a philosopher and statement who actually toured Europe and commented widely on European society, his name is Candy, Candy Aronk, were hotly debated in intellectual salons all over Europe. And they came up with this idea as a result of his sort of very uh, acute critique of uh, putting the mirror back on European society, saying this is how we see you. We can give many other examples to show that it's these colonial encounters and these indigenous critiques, not some autonomous internal process of Western exceptionalism, 
that produced capitalism, modernity, the concepts of East and West, and territorial nationalism. The colonial borderlands is where, like I said, classificatory distinctions of race, class, sexuality, among other things, were developed as concepts. Imperialism and colonialism are not things that happen out there. They are constitutive, constitutive of Europe and the West. And um, as, as long as we ignore this relationship, we don't understand ourselves. That is why it's very strange, but entirely predictable, that history would be for the West and anthropology for the rest, for example. Family would be for the West and kinship for the rest. Or the modern disciplines for the West and area studies for the rest. These distinctions are not natural. They are products, constructs of a way of seeing the world that enabled that world while at the same time saying, I am saying something critical about it. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Uh, so, so it's, it's fine. <laughs> ah, so I will skip my big critique of the discipline of history as an imperialist discipline and why it is and it isn't. I'm going to skip my critique of the development of Islamic and Middle East studies about the zones of invisibility. I'll do that during discussion. Um, about about the, the zones of invisibility that are created by uh, uh, the, the centrality of the colonial encounter to any writing on Middle East and Islamic studies. And um, yes, yes, yes. And I will get to very quick. Two minutes? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the question of in- academic freedom as engaged scholarship. Okay, so how do we decide which topics to choose? What questions to ask? How to go about answering them? For what purpose do we want to produce knowledge? To whom should we communicate that knowledge? And how? Do they have or do we have a responsibility to include the very people and places we study in these decision-making processes? That is the basis of engaged and ethical scholarship, in my opinion. And if so, in what ways? because there's no easy way. I'm not saying these are easy questions or easy solutions. Uh, There are fraught political problems, uh, even for those who think of themselves as just, you know, producing knowledge in order to further activism and, and, and the struggle for liberation. They still, I think, should be held accountable to all sorts of ethical and political questions, which we can discuss. So I would like to just talk just a second about only one aspect of that, which is how can engaged scholarship become institutionalized in universities? How can we reconfigure universities for a new age? Let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing the last 10 years at Brown University. Brown University in the last 10 or 15 years has taken on these questions of indigeneity, indigenous ways of knowing about slavery, injustice, uh, very, very seriously, because Brown University prides itself on being this liberal, progressive uh, uh, university, but of course it knows very well that it was built on land stolen from native people, and it was built by slave labor. And they have decided to recognize and own that responsibility. And so they uh, established a number of new centers and institutes such as the Center for Studies in Slavery and Justice, and hired people to lead them and gave them resources to actually make an impact on teaching students and build over time student interest in this topic. They established the Center for Race and Ethnicity Studies. They established a Center for Indigenous Studies. They have accepted to put in all their communication a land acknowledgement statement saying any, any official communication, Brown University is uh, living on the lands 
of these indigenous people that were taken from them as part of any official communication. And Brown University, I'm proud to say, is the only university in which Palestinian studies has also been instituted. And with the establishment of the Mahmoud Darwish Chair in Palestinian Studies, which is the first chair of its kind in the United States and probably in Europe, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that is dedicated to Palestinian studies. So no longer do you have to hide. No longer you have to tell your students, don't write your first book on Palestine if you want to get hired. Now you can actually say there's an Ivy League school that has a chair in Palestinian studies as a permanent part of its endowed teaching mission. Beer State University also has challenges to face, um, especially in the post-Oslo moment. Uh, during the Oslo period, many universities just started focusing on meeting uh, labor market needs for uh, new ministries and building of a state and for the new corporations and businesses that came in as a result of that. And in many ways, uh, they put aside uh, the larger questions of what it means to produce a kind of a liberatory academic form of knowledge production because they're living under foreign military occupation. They're still living under a colonial rule. Uh, but they're pretending in many ways that they're just normal and they're producing people for the market. Uh, we can no longer afford to think that way in Palestinian higher education. The problem is, and unlike here, I, I gather, but like so many other places in the world, for-profit educational institutions are mushrooming left and right. And their concerns are not on the humanities and the social sciences and social justice or any of these issues. Their concern is about how they can make a profit through higher education. And to have that be a growing and fundamental part of Palestinian higher education is a big problem. Bezate University represents the other end of that spectrum, and that is why I left the United States to take on that position, because I believe it's a very important uh, university. If, by some s magical sweep, uh, the Palestinians receive their freedom and dignity and, and justice tomorrow, uh, they still need to build a society. They need institutions, and Bezate University is that kind of institution that does that, not for profit education. But when you go into Beers at University, you realize that there's a, a real problem in terms of the fact that the critique of disciplinary orthodoxies has not really seeped in except for a few people. Many people who teach in the various disciplines still are kind of consuming 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s kind of understandings of modernization theory and so on and so forth. And so there's an internal struggle in university itself to decolonize their own minds from what they learned in foreign universities that came back to apply at Beers 8. And they realize that these theories that they learned somehow don't work on the ground, uh, but they need to come up with new ways of thinking. So I'm, I, I see there's a huge opportunity for Beers 8 University to be not just consumers of knowledge, but producers. And with the Palestinian condition can become an engine of indigenous ways of knowing. Their experiences have a lot to teach us about relationships between public health and social justice, about uh, climate change and social justice, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think it's very important that Beers 8 University uh, show that it can build a social contract within the university walls between its, the employees, teachers, the administrative staff, the students, the administration, that is, represents the kind of society in which we want to live. We have to practice what we preach. Uh, and that is a very important challenge to th rethinking how is the university organized and for what purpose. And I leave you with that. Thank you very much. Dear guest, may I request you kindly to take back your seats. We are going to start the second part of our um, keynote.
So I believe that not everyone is back, so I will talk slowly so that everyone has the time to come back to their room. First of all, of course, I want to thank also Professor Duna Dumani for his very fault-provoking uh, keynote. And I say fault-provoking not just to be kind or just to say a word that everyone says during uh, when, uh, when someone thanks a keynote speaker for his, for his uh, lecture, but it's really thought-provoking because academic freedom is a very important matter. And for a very long time at Leiden, but at many universities in, in Europe um, and the United States, I guess, academic freedom has been a taken for granted. Academic f freedom is a thing that we do. It's, um, we didn't question it exactly the way that, that Professor, Professor Dumani mentioned it. But now we have to think about it and we have to reflect on it. And uh, your uh, lecture has given us uh, an important point, a starting point to start thinking about it and also a starting point for, the, for our two discussants and also for, for, the, um, for the audience later. Because now I will introduce to you, uh, to speakers who have already been introduced but they will now really give their lecture, Professor, Emeritus Professor Gerrit Ter Haar. She is Emeritus Professor of uh, Religion, uh, which is specialized in religious tradition, especially in Africa. She will give a talk about that and also, I believe, also talk a bit about her uh, personal experiences here. After her um, um, uh, discussion, we will move to Professor Tzolin Albantian, who is a professor of the history of the Middle East here at Leiden University, and she will also speak from her academic experiences and background and reflect on the talk of uh, Professor Dumani. After that, um, I will open the floor and um, you may ask every question you want to ask, um, have on your mind. Um, but I will now make room for uh, Professor Tahar. May I ask you to come forward and give your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, a small, small um, addition. I come from the ISS. I was a professor of religion and development. So it was my task to explore the, um, the role of religion in development processes in, uh, in the world. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Dumani for opening up a very important debate in which he links the history of colonialism and imperial domination to the question of academic freedom and the effects this has had on the knowledge production in our academic institutions. Professor Dumani confronts us, on us with the question whether academic freedom also means freedom from colonial epistemologies and a serious engagement with indigenous ways of knowing. And if so, what would this mean for us as academics and for our academic institutions? Now, my approach to this question is from my background as a scholar of religion with a particular knowledge of Sub-Saharan Africa. Although the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa constitute different regions in many ways, they are comparable in their historical experience of colonial domination, which came with the imposition of intellectual hegemony. And although political domination has ended, intellectual domination has not, if only because most universities in sub-Saharan Africa were founded by white settlers during the colonial era and came with the introduction of colonial epistemologies primarily designed for the benefit of the dominant power. A telling example is South Africa under apartheid. But at that time, the, the black population was living under conditions comparable to what Professor Dubani has described for the Palestinians. The academics of my generation will vividly remember the heated debates that took place at that time in and outside our universities. South African academics have pointed out the critical role the universities placed, played during apartheid in reproducing 
the structural inequalities and injustices in society and how they provided the intellectual basis for the state to continue its functioning. And this was possible because these universities were the prime knowledge producers for the state and its bureaucracy. And in that sense, so for, uh, for uh, furthering the, uh, the, the main ideology of apartheid and thereby of racism. In my own work, I have repeatedly addressed the question of knowledge production stemming from colonial times, especially with regard to Africa, and the implications thereof for the political and religious reality of Africa today. And I specifically mention religion as a critical element for our analysis of modern African societies, but you can, you can make the argument also for other non-Western societies, since this has been consistently overlooked by Western observers generally and policymakers in particular. They had never expected a resurgence of religion after colonial rule had ended. Yet religion is a vital element of African epistemologies and a defining element in the formulation of politics worldwide. And this goes for many parts of the world, including in Africa. Islam, or what many of us tend to refer to as political Islam, is only one example. But the same can be said of Christianity, which has been appropriated in such a way as to inspire many Africans to resist and put an end to white political domination. All of this is reason enough to engage with religious ideas as an important source of knowledge, source of knowledge for many people in the world. People that we generally consider to be not like us. In my most recent book, Black Minds Matter, I've argued that respecting black lives, as is more and more the case under the influence of the Black Lives Matter movement, is not enough. But that we are also called upon to respect black minds. That means to take seriously a world of ideas that has grown from a history different from white and especially European history, and which often includes ideas about an invisible world that constitutes a source of power, namely spiritual power. And these are religious ideas that inform social and practical practice in Africa up till today. Engagement with indigenous ways of knowing, in practice then, engagement with knowledge production originating in a non-Western historical context cannot be done without taking into account the impact of colonialism and racial superiority in the field of academia. If I limit myself to Africa, it is striking how our academic vocabulary is riddled with concepts that not only continue to reflect a colonial mindset, and I would say coming from where I come from, as I told you, including even the concept of development, but also continue to suggest that white minds are fundamentally different from black minds. In my own discipline, the study of religion, this becomes clear, for example, in the way in which similar experiences are designated by a word carrying a positive connotation in a European context on the one hand, and by a word with a negative connotation in an African context on the other. Now, I can give many examples of this. It comes down in the end uh, that uh, our religion is good, other religions are bad. Uh, we, we have a religion, others have superstition. Uh, our, our beliefs are, yeah, their esoteric beliefs are mystical, uh, other beliefs, African beliefs are magical. In the same way, our beliefs are considered rational and therefore valid. Well, the beliefs of others <clears throat> are not, as, this, as these beliefs are deemed non-rational. Valid knowledge, thus, is knowledge created on the basis of methodologies, 
tested and tried in our part of the world and subsequently declared to be of universal value and thus worthy of being spread around the world. Indigenous knowledge, on the other hand, is usually considered as having meaning only in its own context, hence as a form of knowledge exclusively belonging to a particular culture and therefore of limited validity. This includes religious or spiritual knowledge, a type of knowledge which may be good for them, but of no relevance to us. In effect, we continue to use exclusive rather than inclusive language in the study of Africa and other non-Western parts of the world. Decolonization has not halted the process of othering, and hence the recent appeals for the decolonization of the mind. Now, what does all this mean for the question of academic freedom? At this point, I want to connect my arguments so far with the issue of human rights. In a general sense, academic freedom is stipulated by the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the words of Amnesty International, a document that acts like a global roadmap for freedom and equality. Academic freedom, as we habitually understand it, constitutes a universal right that everyone should be able to freely exercise irrespective of their views and opinions, provided these are expressed in ways that are also stipulated by the Universal Declaration, namely that none of these rights and freedoms may be exercised contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. In the Universal Declaration too, rights are limited by duties. In this case, the moral obligation to respect the rights of others in the debate and, and to uphold their dignity. If we take the age-old motto of this university, Presidium Libertatis, still seriously today, this should also imply a reconsideration of questions that till recently we had no reason to think about too much, such as the nature of academic knowledge and its relation to colonial domination, the politics and ethics of our knowledge production, and indeed, whether or not we have a special responsibility to those people we study, and if so, what kind of responsibility? These are not questions that either I or other present here, present here can simply and easily answer, if only because the political context in which we are seeking questions, answers to these questions can hugely differ. Most important, in my view, is that we define an agenda for discussions of these questions in all our faculties. From what I've said earlier, you may deduce that in my view, this means for a start that we must take non-Western epistemologies seriously, not just as an interest, interesting worldview pertaining to others, and therefore no need for us to think about, but exploring the option that indigenous modes of thought may actually have universal value. And if I may take one uh, example from Africa, it is its holistic worldview. Non-Western academics, I've argued before, have long been criticizing the fact that, and I quote one of them, post-colonialism continues to render non-Western knowledge and culture as other in, in relation to the normative self of Western epistemology and rationality. And I personally would agree with that statement. And this was a statement made many years ago in the 1990s and even before the Indian economist Deepak Lal, and you may have heard of him, he died a few years ago, in a public lecture in the year 2000 here at Leiden University, criticized Western models of social and political action that aspire to be of universal application as, and I quote again, 
as actually part of a culture specific. I start again as actually part of a culture specific proselytizing ethic of what remains at heart Western Christendom. It seems to me that we have not made much progress since uh, Deepak Lal formulated this critique more than 20 years ago. The challenge therefore remains to look at key concepts in the social sciences and the humanities in the light of data drawn not just from Western society, but from the full range of human societies as part of the necessary process of decolonizing our minds. Would that not mean, some may ask, that serious academics also become social activists? And would that be a bad thing? In my view, certainly not. All it means is that as scholars, we take responsibility for our share in the historical legacy of knowledge production in academic institutions and for the social conditions that intellectual colonialism has helped to create. As academics, we are also responsible citizens of this world who must speak out when and where they meet injustice, in and outside our university buildings. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for Lucis for organizing this, including all of the help the student assistants made as well. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here uh, and contribute to this important conversation started by Bashara and continued uh, by Kheri. Recently, the Artsakh or Kharapakh war between Azerbaijan and Armenia and Palestine-related interventions both here at Leiden University and abroad made me think about the parallels and linkages between various arenas in the greater Middle East of political activism and related academic freedom. On October 29, 2020, 2022, the editorial board of the Harvard Crimson published in support of boycott, divestment, sanctions, and a free Palestine in support of divestment from Israel. In it, the editorial board cited the importance of global solidarity and charges leveled by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch against Israel of crimes against humanity. The Crimson clearly had changed its position from 2002 when its staff had published Do Not Divest from Israel regarding the comparison between Israel and, apart and apartheid era South Africa so fundamentally flawed as to be offensive. In 20 years, the conversation on college campuses had indeed changed, or had it? Just a few weeks before the Harvard Crimson published its support of divestment from Israel, Leiden University took a different stand, actually preventing a student-organized event on racism, apartheid, and intersectionality from taking place on campus. Bashara mentioned this. The reasons the university gave varied, none were particularly substantiated, it claimed it wanted to guarantee security. It was concerned that students and staff with different opinions and perspectives could not speak freely and safely. And it claimed that the chair of the event, Dina Zabedi, a female Dutch Palestinian academic, had to have a neutral profile. Apparently, these were issues of house rules, which most of my colleagues had, strangely enough, never known about or been subjected to. Which stance, Harvard or Leiden's, is more representative globally? In a matter of weeks, one was reminded that the recognition of crimes against humanity was not universal. What are the effects of this varied treatment of injustice? One consequence is located within the realm of authority. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International concluded that Israel's system of domination over Palestinians was akin to apartheid. At Harvard, their assessment legitimated the Crimson's call. At Leida, the role of moderator that the Dutch Palestinian academic was to take invalidated both Human Rights Watch's and Amnesty International's findings. This incongruence renders recognition ambiguous, facilitating an environment that makes Palestine, as in the injustice leveraged against it, its history, and its people, debatable. 
This perpetuates the injustice and inherited trauma by those who have experienced it. Because the issue is unsettled, the fight for universal recognition continues. Palestine has long been the premier anti-colonial struggle in the field of Middle Eastern studies. It also continues to reflect the demand to include indigenous, ethnic, and religious minorities in our academic work. And yet, Palestine's prominence obscures other historical injustices. For this, its influence is often admired and even envied. Once marginal, Palestine has become the reference point for ethnic cleansing, settler colonialism, and apartheid. This very view and the change it has caused, like at Harvard's Crimson, makes Palestine a cause to emulate and its celebrity something to desire. But what does it mean to yearn for the popularity of another's trauma when you are traumatized yourself? This surely isn't solidarity, but a sickness. One begs for another's pain under the false presumption that it could alleviate one's own. Palestine is not alone here. Before deciding to pursue a PhD in Middle Eastern studies, I enrolled in a joint journalism Near Eastern Studies MA program at New York University. I had to write a series of journalistic pieces and chose to focus on Armenians in the United States. I reported on how Armenians craved the recognition that was granted by the general American public to the Jewish Holocaust. My sources talked about how tired they were of the pervasiveness of Holocaust recognition and their wish that the Armenian genocide could even have a small proportion of the exposure that the Jewish Holocaust had. Although some respondents' envy veered toward, towards anti-Semitism, many simply expressed how much they wanted recognition for the Armenian genocide. But did Armenians ever pause to think about what they envied or what behavior they engaged in by taking part in this competition? In addition to being surreal and morbid, what does it do to the self to be struggling for recognition of one's trauma and victimization? The situation also was felt by Armenian studies scholars. Many attempted to connect the Armenian genocide to works that only marginally engaged with the planned extermination of the Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire during World War I. This move was partly defensive in nature and an overcompensation for both the lack of universal recognition by colleagues in Middle Eastern and Ottoman and Turkish studies and the official denialism perpetuated by the modern state of Turkey. Any opportunity to use the term Armenian genocide was taken. Neglecting to do so was seen to help denialism. The unsettled recognition of the Armenian genocide, however, had an additional effect on the field. Whereas Palestine became the premier anti-colonial struggle and eclipsed other similar forms of injustices, the Armenian genocide became the premier genocide of the field of Middle Eastern studies and suppressed other experiences of genocidal violence. Books published within the last five years on the making of the modern Middle East reckoned with the destructive aspects of the formation of modern nation states, including the Armenian genocide, famine, and war. At the same time, their engagement with the role of mass violence against the Armenians in the making of the modern Middle East did not extend to the killing of Assyrians. The Armenian genocide has become a gatekeeper of ethnic and religious violence in the Middle East during World War I. In scholarship published in the United States and in Europe, it's no longer a forgotten genocide. But as for Palestine, its recognition does not make it a settled matter. And although Middle Eastern, Ottoman, and Turkish studies have finally begun to recognize the genocide, there are limits. What is recognition if it still allows for injustice to be ignored or debated? Despite recognition, ongoing violence and ethnic cleansing of Armenians in regions just adjacent to the field in the Southern Caucasus continue to be ignored. It is as if once the fields accepted the Armenian genocide reality, everyone, including Armenian studies, moved on. Middle Eastern studies from considering other violence targeting Armenians, Armenian studies from considering similar violence targeting non-Armenians. In a way, this mirrors what has happened regarding Palestine. Has moving this cause from the margins to the center marginalized other cases and causes, even though some works on Palestine call for considering, for considering indigenous and religious minorities? In an effort to draw attention to the active denial campaigns of the Nakba and the Armenian Genocide, have these two causes for justice inadvertently worked to exclude others? And if yes, 
How can we stop this cycle? The truth is, injustice isn't uniform. Or rather, if it was, outrage is not. Here in the Netherlands, I have seen this with the Russian war in the Ukraine since this past February. BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanction campaigns were all the rage in March and April, the same months our students at Leiden were fighting to have their panel on apartheid, racism, and intersectionality. Students and colleagues alike explain the differences between quotation marks because they really are arbitrary, between Ukraine and, the, and Palestine, and between the Armenian genocide and Azerbaijani aggression against Armenians as issues of shared history and geography. Apparently, the Armenian genocide is recognized in justice. The Karapakh conflict is debatable. The Netherlands is closer to the Ukraine and to potential conflict with Russia than Palestine. But how close, though? In the first weeks of the war, my students asked for class time to draw attention to organized clothing drives. But the initial outrage abated. By June, the Ukrainian flags that hang in people's windows or flagpoles in front of their houses became normalized. They were soon joined by school backpacks on flagpoles, the custom to announce that a high school student has passed their exams. Did it help to have been so close to the Dutch public that they recognized and, supp and supported Ukraine and its dominance of the news cycle for the last few months? Sure. Did it help by September? Not really. For all the yearning for recognition, did we ever pause to think about what it would look like? Rather than engaging in trauma or recognition envy, I wonder if it is actually the responsibility of those who have experienced this pain to make the connections to others who have undergone a similar experience. In other words, the onus is on the victim to create a network of those who have suffered. Although many would shudder at yet another obligation conferred, conferred upon the victim rather than the perpetrator, I wonder if there are additional ways of looking at this. Wouldn't it be empowering to connect to others to prevent solidarity from fading? Real solidarity would stop the fight. For this to happen, one would need to consider what it is, what it is to come or what is to come after recognition. What does recognition look and feel like? Which new responsibilities will flow from recognition? If we continue to see recognition as its own end, we risk generating the same dynamic while falsely claiming victory, a victory that comes at the expense of somebody else's trauma and conceals within itself the very injustice that it claims to correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peri Solin. Uh, without further much ado, I will open up the floor for, for questions, for Q&A. But uh, I warn you, don't be too long. If I don't hear a question mark in your, in your, question, in your um, words, I will uh, intervene. So, because I would like to have the time as short, as many as people's voices heard, and uh, as many as people uh, be able, able to ask a question. Uh, there will be a microphone, uh, so if you have a, a question, please raise your hand, uh, maybe stand up and, 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 and tell us what your name is and uh, ask your question. 